I am, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We have some great philosophy for you today. I'm really excited to introduce the importance of free software and the liberation of cyberspace. Now, a computer is a universal machine. You can make it do anything with the right program. Most of these programs have two forms. The source code that programmers write and change, and the executable, which is a bunch of signals for the processor. And the problem is, who gives the instructions to your computer? It turns out it might be obeying someone else. Software either controls the users or it's controlled by the users. It's that simple. When the users do control it, we call it free software. It respects the user's freedom and community. Now, free actually means freedom, not free of charge. And so we can say free slash libre to show that. To have control, we need four essential freedoms. The first one is the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. The second is the freedom to study and change the source code so it does what you want. If you only get the executable, then it's really complicated to study and change it. To get the real possibility to study and change the program, you got to get the source code now. With those two freedoms, each user separately can make a copy and make changes. But that's just individual control. What if you're not a programmer and you don't understand it? We also need collective control, which means any group can work together to adapt the program to what they want. So we need two more freedoms, the freedom to give away or sell exact copies when you wish, and the freedom to do the same with modified versions. Now, if any of those freedoms is missing, then it's non-free proprietary software and the users don't control the program. Instead, the developer controls the program and the program controls the users. So the program is an instrument of unjust power. And the developer often takes advantage of this power with malicious functionalities. Most users of proprietary software are actually using malware. It can spy on users and stop them from doing what they want. It can even remotely delete books as Amazon did with 1984. Developers can remotely change the software. Microsoft does this with Windows through a universal backdoor. Microsoft also sabotages users by telling the NSA about bugs in Windows so it can use them to attack computers. And this is driving us crazy. The FSF has been very fortunate. It's been able to introduce a free world. In 1983, we introduced the plan to develop a totally free OS called Genu. In 1992, Linus Torvalds introduced the Linux kernel, which filled the last gap and gave us GNU plus Linux. Today, there's many distros of GNU plus Linux. But here's the thing. Most of them actually have non-free software added. Why? Well, they're maintained by people who don't care about freedom. They add convenience, but at the cost of freedom. Every once in a while, keeping your freedom requires sacrifice. It can be huge as at Lexington, but in our campaign, they tend to be little sacrifices. Anyone with a bit of maturity can make these sacrifices. So as an example, some programs are non-free, so to have freedom, you've got to do without them. Now, websites can send non-free JavaScript to your browser. You can block it with Libre.js. And companies may offer to do your computing. They say, send us all your data, obviously for suckers. Then they do the computing on their servers and send you results. It turns out they're actually taking away your control and we call it a service as a software substitute. We need to cross obstacles. One of them is big companies that profit by having control over users. They don't want to let us advance. Another is the more mainstream open source philosophy. It's about the same programs, but not the moral obligation to give freedom. To keep our freedom, we got to talk about it and say free software. There's also non-free software in schools. It's like teaching kids to smoke tobacco. It creates dependence. Schools must prepare kids for an independent, cooperative, and free society. And some kids want to know how the programs work. With non-free software, you can learn anything. Schools should also teach goodwill. You're all familiar with the concept of sharing, right? We learned it in kindergarten. If you bring cookies to class, you share them with your friends. They should also say, if you bring a program, you can't keep it to yourself. Share the source code so other people can learn. So only bring free software. 
Now, the school must follow its own rule, which means only free software in class, except for reverse engineering exercises. Another obstacle is hardware we don't know how to write free software for. They won't tell us how to use it. They say, here's a non-free program you can use. Run it and shut up. So we need reverse engineering. New areas of life to, can make new human rights needed. These rights actually support and strengthen one another. So in the world of computing, the freedoms of free software are among the human rights that society must establish and protect. Now, there's many ways to help. You can write free software, tell schools and governments to use free software, help other people install and use it, and spread the philosophical ideas by saying free software. Thank you very much.